Thank you very much. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am Anna from the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Um, I feel extremely um, honored to be the last presenter of Mobile 2018. Um, before I proceed, I would like to say the work that I'm presenting today is in collaboration with New York University and the University of Virginia. Um, right, and the title is, of course, Sensitivity has been automated by our policy enforcement in mobile research apps. All right, so when we talk about mobile research apps, we think that there are a lot of cool things that we can do, such as diagnosing mental health issues, so I know why students don't come to my class. Um, also, we can figure out uh, things like why apps are not as well um, as we're expecting, or do things like augmented reality. So that means nothing should go wrong, right? Um, it turns out, here's an example when things can go wrong. Um, just a couple months ago, uh, we have a fitness app. This app tries to, they figure out they want to apply a heat map um, or their user's uh, exercise trajectory. Uh, so this little area here is something that's a little sensitive. So that idea is cool. We want to see which route are more popular than the other. It turns out soldiers like to work out too. So this area is actually that red face. Um, apologies if you are um, colorblind. So this area is a military base of a, gov of a government. Uh, fortunately, it's not U.S. government, and we cannot see this area on Google Maps because Google figure out it's a sensitive area, so they blurred it out. But now everybody will be able to see that is the place where the soldiers are running around every day. And then the next thing um, uh, is remember that a few more years back, Google accidentally gathered some sensitive data. These are the web activity from our networks when they are using their street cars driving around. Um, apologies again, there's nothing against Google. This is just an example I'm using. So we say from this example, we can tell privacy violation can occur if we're not careful. The primary result for that. Uh, reason for that is that um, when we're uh, carrying our devices around us, there are a lot of sensors that are quite sensitive, such as the camera. Camera can be used to look at what people are currently doing, and other things like GPS, Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi cellular networks, these kind of things can be used to track the location of a device. And finally, we have a bunch of motion sensors as well. Accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer. We'll probably see like these kind of things are pretty innocent, but if the access rates to them are high enough, we can try to figure out the tapping motion of a user so that I can learn what password I type in or the credit card number. So these are quite dangerous things that we're dealing with. So in order to mitigate these kind of risks, a lot of universities and research institutions use a board called IRB, Institutional Review Board. This board is a um, team of people, and they reveal the re uh, research proposals involving human subjects, and then they will tell the researcher, here are a list of things you can do and a list of other things that you cannot. All right, so this sounds good, but there is a big caveat. So whenever we apply for IRB approval, the process is very time consuming. So usually it takes uh, at least a month. So if uh, anybody is getting the approval within a week, I would like to talk to you. Um, so that is the first disadvantage of that. And of course, another thing is, even after the researcher has got the IRB approval, there is no guarantee that the researcher will be able to follow the protocol. Some of the reasons is that some researcher might be accidentally over data without even knowing. So that is a lot of um, challenging we're facing. And as a result, we have designed a system called sensitivity testbed, and it automates the enforcement of privacy policy uh, that is set by our IRB, and then it executes these policies at runtime when a researcher runs code on these mobile devices. 
And how does it do, it, do this kind of thing? Uh, we use a bunch of obfuscation for sensors in the secure sandbox. So that's a secure sandbox, I'm going to introduce that later. And now let's just assume it's an environment where the experiment can be run. Due to this obfuscation, we can do a bunch of things like identifying the city instead of revealing the actual GPS coordinates of the device. We can also do things like access, um, uh, limit the access frequency to certain sensors, like we can limit GPS can only be updated once every 10 minutes. And these kind of things can be customized to suit any sort of IRB compliance. All right, so here I'm going to give you a high-level walkthrough of how this entire system works. On the left-hand side, we have a device owner called Status, and here we have a researcher called Rhonda, and in between them, we have a test server. The first thing that we're going to see is that Alice decided I am going to uh, contribute my device to scientific research, so she is going to download and install our testbed app. And then after that, she can go and configure the privacy settings in her app. Suppose that she's not very comfortable with other people using her mic, so she can just block that. And then the next thing, researcher Rhonda. She wants to study the cellular technologies in her city. So she get the IRB approved, and then the IRB will tell her, you can use randomized cell ID, but you cannot use the real ID. Is to protect the location privacy. And all the data has to be updated every 10 minutes. So after this, Rhonda will then go to our testbed server and fill out a form. And that form is going to indicate which kind of configuration she needs for her IRB. And after she filled out the form, the testbed server is going to push all the policies to the end user devices such as the one that's sold by Alice. And after this, we will be able to have our researcher Rhonda running the experiment directly on the device. So here, this is an example is showing a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but it doesn't have to. So a researcher can run his or her code on a bunch of devices, maybe 10 devices, and the same device can also host and different experiments from different um, researchers. So that's just a side note. With this kind of interaction, we have the following threat model. So we assume that Rhonda may accidentally access the private uh, data on Alice's device. This cannot be prevented by her IRP because her IRP would just not know about it. And we also assume, assume that we have a attacker. And he might be maliciously compromising Rhonda's experiment and then click whatever data he wants to. So how to make this thing work? Um, the answer is we deploy different policies at different places. The first place that we are going to have our policy in place is at the UI. So the device owner, like Alice, she can go in into the app and then adjust her privacy preference accordingly if she wants to. Disable her camera, she can do that too. And this kind of configuration is going to be used for filtering the raw data on the outcome of the sandbox. So you might think UI configuration is easy, but there is a little catch. We have two different purposes for the UI configuration. The first one is to provide informed consent. When Alice opens up her app, she is going to give consent to researchers such as Rhonda, so she can run, Rhonda can run IRB approved experiment on Alice's device. And at the same time, Rhonda will be bound to her IRB agreement at her institution. As a result, Alice and Rhonda do not need to establish a relationship prior to Rhonda running the experiment. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Alice can configure her policies uh, or according to her preference. So she can opt out of individual experiments if she doesn't like any of them. She can also stop all of them at once. And furthermore, she can control in a more fine-grained manner how she wants the sensor to be accessed. And then the next place 
data, we're going to have our policy report is in the sandbox itself. So these policies are called baseline policies, and they can be adjusted according to different kind of IRB compliance. All right, so more details about baseline policies. These are set in place to prevent some of the common privacy attacks. We got these to reveal some of the current literature as well as some common RB rules. And these policies are used to first disable some of the highest sensitive sensors, the camera or mic, and it also disables the intrusive action like making a phone call or like uh, scanning a barcode on behalf of the device owner. So you might be asking, uh, what if my research had to have these kind of sensors enabled? We have a separate vetting process where if you want to have access to them, um, we are going to review your uh, research proposal and hopefully get that to you within a week. And then the next thing, uh, the baseline policy are going to obfuscate some of the common privacy risks. These risks including um, identifying a device by its MAC address or its device ID, so we can put the hash on the MAC address or truncate some part of um, your device ID. And another risk is to locate a device through GPS, cell ID, Wi-Fi access ID, and so on. We have a way to obfuscate that too. And finally, we prevent things like inferring the keystrokes using like the accelerometer or infer the activity of a device owner. All right, so how can a researcher like adjust these baseline policy according to her IRB? So Rhonda first has to go to our test bed server and she is going to indicate the precision and frequency that how her IRB is going to allow her to access each of the sensor. And each um, baseline policy will have one for each of the sensors. She only needs to indicate a parameter for each one of them. And I am going to give some example of how exactly such kind of obfuscation can be done. Um, before that, um, I am going to give some background on our secure sandbox. So this sandbox is um, a running experiment and the environment for different uh, experiments. So it provides a bunch of system calls, such as networking calls, file system, running, locking, and so on. The most important ones are the sensor calls, such as get location, get the spirometer, and so on. And the next thing is very important, because we're running experiments on end user devices, we do not want to take up too much of the resources on end user devices. So this sandbox also provides resource isolation. So we're going to limit here is the percentage, it's a 10% of CPU time you can take away from the device, and 10 meg of memory, and 15% of network bandwidth. And finally, if the battery level of the device is low, say 20%, then we're going to stop for the experiment. And the most important of all, our sandbox also provides a way to interpose on these system calls so that we can change their behavior. If you are interested in knowing about the detail, the implementation of such a sandbox, here is our, our publication in CCS 2010. All right, so how do we obfuscate the data? Two examples. The first one is to reduce the data precision. Here I'm using an example where we're going to obfuscate Alice's location to a nearest city center. So the call to make the full precision location is just get location. So we're going to get um, define a different um, function called get city location. We're going to get it full precision first. And then after that, we're going to look up the city center and return that location instead. And after this, every single call to get location will get interposed and then replaced by a call to get city location instead. In another example, here I would want to restrict the data access frequency, and I'm using an accelerometer as an example. If, say, we want to limit the access to from 100 hertz, say to 50 hertz, 
What can we do? We are going to pause the call for some time, so the access will be slower. So the original call to get accelerometer is here, get accelerometer itself, and we're going to implement a different function called rate limited, and we provide a input argument. So first thing that we do in this function is we pause the code for some time, and then we're going to call the original call. And every time when we're going to make this call to get this parameter, we're going to interpose that and replace by the limited version. So to put everything together, we use a policy hierarchy. And this hierarchy, it combines the device owner policy as well as the hierarchy policy together. More precisely, we have a stack of different policies together. Each stack is going to be a layer, each policy is a layer, and it inherits the policy that has been defined in its ancestor layers. And the experiment is going to be running at the top of this stack. As a result, it's going to inherit all the lower layers. Um, there is also a side note, we got the baseline policy by reviewing the current literature, so if we're going to have new attacks coming in the future, we are going to change our baseline policy. Because of the design of our sandbox, it's pretty straightforward to extend our current baseline policies. Um, how well does it work? Um, I'm going to answer that by asking three different questions. The first one is, do the proposed privacy policy effectively pro protect device owners? Here we're going to see a potential attack that can um, monitor the activity that is being done by the device owner. So when the accelerometer access is at 50 hertz, we can tell very distinctively that either the device owner is making a phone call or is holding the phone in hand, like reading an email or whatnot, and he might also be putting it in the backpack or in the pocket. These are the cases where the device owner is walking. So in order to figure out how to combat this path, we subsample the accelerometer data from 10 to 50 hertz. So in this diagram, I'm showing the classification accuracy. And we can tell there is a sharp decline in the tracking accuracy when the access rate is about 25 hertz. So as a result, if we can limit the access rate to be 25 hertz or lower, then this kind of attack will never occur. So that is one case um, where we can prevent this attack. And the second question comes naturally. So if we limit the precision or the accuracy or the uh, access rate to these sensors, what utility can these restricted data provide? So in the previous example, from our experience, we can tell that the rate limited data suffices for many other applications. In the case of the activity monitoring, the accelerometer data, when it's reduced to 25 hertz, it can still be used for pedometry because we will be able to see the peaks and the low, but we won't be able to infer the activity that's specific to the user. And in the second case, um, a couple years ago, we had a high school student. Um, he did a project using sensibility testnet where the GPS location has been restricted to a zip code area. And this student connected his device to a OBD sensor in his car, and he captured the information such as fuel consumption, pressure, mileage, and engine RPM. And although the location is restricted to a zip code area, he was able to make inferences about traffic conditions. So while it's an open question whether obfuscating policies may affect the accuracy of many experiments, we are planning to carry out more studies like this to investigate further about the privacy and functionality trade-off. And the final question that we're going to ask is, is sensibility easy to use? So in the past years, um, we hosted some hackathons coloured with the IEEE conference called SAS. And the majority of participants of this um, conference, they are not coming from the background of computer science. Um, we let these participants spend about half a day learning about how to use this particular platform and then let them start writing code and ask for different purposes. And to our surprise, many of these researchers were able to build interesting and complex applications 
including navigating between conference rooms using some information coming from the Wi-Fi connection, or monitoring battery and uh, turning off Wi-Fi or Bluetooth when the battery level is really low. So these are some pictures coming from the hackathon. Um, this guy um, gave me the consent to use his face in this guy, and he is also one of the co-authors of this paper. Um, and finally, I would like to conclude with some challenges that we're still facing, and we haven't resolved these challenges yet. The first one is related to accessing personal data. We currently deliberately disallow access to personal data stored on the phone, such as your phone book, and we also disallow the introspection into the mobile OS. The way that we want to do this is to make it easy for people to use. Um, but we haven't investigated the approaches that is like querying a database using privacy preserving techniques like. Um, differential privacy or key anonymity, and these kind of things are worth looking into. And the second challenge is that because we cannot predict what kind of attack will emerge in the future, we need to update our baseline policy and also upgrade our platform accordingly. And finally, usability. Because currently we give some control to our um, device owners, and how much control can we give them is still an open question. And we are planning on doing some user study to figure out how, how much control we should exactly give to the users. So um, with that, um, I'm finishing and concluding my presentation, and I'm ready to take